All right. <clears throat> well, let's, uh, let me just remind you of a few things. I just p put a few slides down here. We're working our way through. I tr I'm trying to, we're going we're gonna to complete this today because we need to. Uh, and plus, uh, yeah, we're going to complete this. We're on the back page. I keep scrunching them up a little bit, but just some of the, some of the things we, what is, di what is dispensationalism? What is a dispensation? That's really important to answer because there's all kinds of false ideas, confusion out there and um, about that. But basically, remember, as we said, it comes from an understanding of a word oikonomia or economia, economy. We get our English word economy. It means, it has to do with administration, management, like a house. That's literally what it means. House rule, house law. O oikonomia. And it appears a number of times in the New Testament, that word. But dispensationalists, or dispensationalism, uh, well, wait, that's not the one I wanted. I'm sorry. That's not the one I wanted. I wanted to get to a different one. Ah, it's number nine. Okay. Dispensationalism sees the world as a household that is administrated and managed by God, the creator. In his household, God directs everything for his own glory. That is the ultimate theme of scripture, is the glory of God. And he does this by giving different revelation to different people and groups over time. And, we, and we're tracing this now throughout from the time of creation and Adam and Eve right up into the time of the, of the dispensation of the fullness of the times, which is the eternal state. There are various administrations and ways God... But that's what it is. By giving different revelation to different groups, people and groups, this revelation, this... <laughs> Sorry. I don't know why that does that. But anyway, this revelation... I've got to stop waving my hands. I'll go like this. <laughs> this revelation results in distinct administrations or dispensations over those people and groups. Okay. So, we looked at that, and then... Um, I want to jump to this one. We looked at the three essentials, and we're going to be coming back to this beginning next week. We're really going to focus in on number one there. And I'm going to show what are the distinctions. We're going to move down through in a parallel, show the distinctions. But three essentials of dispensationalism. This is what makes a person a dispensationalist. <clears throat> number one, a very clear distinction between Israel as an ethnic entity, a descendant of Abraham through Isaac and through Jacob. Not just a descendant of Abraham, because Arabs are descendants of Abraham, but no, descendant of Abraham through Isaac specifically and through Jacob, who was named Israel and his children, the children of Israel. So a distinction between Israel and the church. Secondly, a literal interpretation of the Bible, approaching the Bible in a normal plain, literal, in its historical, grammatical context. Every, we're, the goal in our reading and studying of the Bible is what was the author's intent? Not only God who's the author, but the, the particular writer of Scripture, whether it's Moses or whether it's Paul or whatever. What was the author's intent? And we do that by grammatical, historical context and reading the words in their normal, plain Reading. We don't look for hidden meanings behind the sentences, behind the words. That's allegory. That there's hidden meanings behind the normal plain meaning. No, no. No, we treat God's word with respect. Our goal is to find out the author's intent through that method. That's a distinction of, that is an essential of dispensationalism. And then re the recognition of God's glory as the underlying purpose of all scripture and of all his various ways of administrating and managing his world.
It's for his glory. All right. Um, so, and then we did that, and then we went to this next one, I think. Yeah, we're here now, and we're looking at the various dispensations. And we got through several of them, and let's just do, uh, let's down at the bottom there. Let's look at the various dispensations. There are five dispensations before the church. And you say, well, how do you know when a dis dispensation begins? If we can determine when God gave new revelation, revealed new truth, and expectations of human beings, a group or, an, or whatever, we can identify when a new dispensation begins. So let's just review. The dispensation number one is called the dispensation. By the way, I'm presenting to you a nine dispensation scheme. I think that, I think that after, after the church, there's not one dispensation of the kingdom but there's the dispensation of the great tribulation and the dispensation of the eternal state. But we'll, we'll, I'm going to present that scheme. Remember, it's not the number of dispensations that make a person a dispensationalist. Or if you hold to nine and you only hold to four, you know, oh, uh, uh, you're not as pure of a dispensation as I am. Uh-uh, has nothing to do with that. What I showed you about the three essentials, that is what makes a dispensationalist. How they see the various administrations and um, how, they, how they identify those, and there's, there's difference of opinion. And there have been for four centuries since, the, you know, there's one scheme that has 12. So, anyway, so I'm presenting this nine, nine scheme, five of them before the church. And we're looking for when God gave new revelation, that's when we can identify a new dispensation. Well, the first dispensation is right at the beginning of the word of God, Genesis 1 and 2. And it's the dispensation of innocence. Innocence. Okay, I'll just quickly go over this. Or the dispensation of free will. And the scripture is Genesis 1 and 2. After creation, before the fall, it was a very short-lived dispensation this is, by the way, this one doesn't go on. There's a beginning, there's an end. Creation and the fall, right in between there. It was a very short-lived administration of God's creation, of his creatures. Um, it describes a time when there were few laws over humanity, because it was Adam and Eve, and a seemingly perfect relationship between God and man, his creation. Adam and Eve were commanded this, to populate the planet. They were given complete dominion over all the creation. And they were to subdue everything, bring it under their control. They were to eat the fruit from the tree of the... They were not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And... Um, I mean, they, I, the third one, they were only to eat from plants. They were not to be carnivorous, were eating animals. They were to be only eat plants. And they were not to eat, however, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because if they did, that would result in immediate death. Even though Adam died when he was 930 years old. Physically, he died immediately when they went to hide from God. They were separated from the creator. Okay, it's called the dispensation of innocence because humans had not yet sinned and there was no inherent sin nature in people. Okay, humans were innocent before God. Adam and Eve were innocent. There was no sin nature. Um, they had not sinned yet. So we call this innocence or we can call it free will because it was the only time in human history that man had a completely unbiased ability to choose to obey and disobey God. That has never been true ever since the fall. People do not have a free will. I mean, unsaved people. There are all kinds of, they've got a sin nature. And there's all kinds of uh, things that are involved in keeping them in bondage. 
as Romans 8, 7 says, the mind set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. It can't. Those controlled by the flesh cannot please God. That's not free, folks. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God for their foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they're discerned by the spirit of God. And the man in the flesh does not have that. So, so that's why we call it the dispensation of innocence and the dispensation of free will. Okay, that ended, that dispensation, that administration of God over creation uh, particularly Adam and Eve, ended at the, at the time of the fall. And that brings us, secondly, look at your notes there, to the dispensation of moral conscience. This is in Genesis chapter 3. It, occur, it occurred um, immediately after the fall. This is the next period or time of new revelation that's given. As God had promised, Adam and Eve died spiritually when Adam ate the fruit in direct rebellion to God's command. While there were eventually some physical consequences, for example, increased pain in childbirth for women, increased labor to provide food because the grounds are going to produce thorns and thistles. It's just going to, you're going to have to eke out a living. It's going to be lots of work, sweat, to get the ground to produce, to have enough water, to get the weeds out of there, to keep bugs and and you know, disease from overcoming your crop. It's going to be work. Not only that, but there's physical death that would ultimately come. While there were some physical consequences that would come, the spiritual consequences were much greater and they were immediate. Separation from creator. Spiritual death caused a separation from God that marked a change in how God had to deal with and govern humanity. Although God promised to send a redeemer, Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent and set things right, humanity entered a new relationship with God based on an infinite number of unspoken and unwritten laws. He wrote, he wrote it on man's conscience. Okay? The law of God, the law is written on people's conscience. Everyone has the law of God, no matter how remote they are. They all have it. It's in, their, it's in them, and they know that because they're human beings, so it's there. So he wrote it on their hearts, and that's what Paul says in Romans chapter 2. He says, when the Gentiles who don't have the law, the pagans, do by nature the things in the law. They don't have it, but they do by nature the things in it. These, although they, not having the law, they're a law to themselves. They show the work of the law written in their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness. And their thoughts accusing or excusing them. Now, consciences can be corrupted. They can be seared. They can be twisted and perverted as sinners. But everyone's got a moral sense and a conscience. All right, so that was the third. We've got to keep moving. D dispensation number three was the dispensation of human government. This was after the flood. Okay, following the flood, there was new information given, new revelation given to Noah. God told Noah, this is Genesis 9, Noah and his family were to repopulate the earth. And they didn't do that, right? Eventually, they, they came down on the plains of Shinar and they stayed there and they built these great cities right around them, the cradle of civilization, and then they built a tower whose, he whose top represented heaven, the zodiac. Uh, they worshiped the stars and the, their, their gods and so forth. But the point is this. Um, God confused their language. Babel. He confused their language and scattered people groups. Scattered people. There were no people groups. He scattered people all over the, the planet. They, they left each other because they couldn't communicate. So they moved away, and that's where all the various ethnicities and people groups came out of that. And it came very quick, too. 
Second, humans who were originally vegetarian were now able to eat meat after the flood. God said you can eat every living thing that moves upon the face of the ground, including and in addition to the green herbs, the veg ve vegetation. And then humans were to execute murderers. Life is precious because life is created in the image of God. Life is, is sacred. Every life is sacred. And God now commanded society to hold human life as sacred and to put to death any animal or person who violated God's image by murdering. And here we're coming up on the, here we're coming up on the anniversary of Roe versus Wade, right? Where we, along with many other pagan Gentile nations, put together millions and billions of infants because life begins at conception. By the way, we know that scientifically. That's not, a, that's not my opinion. It's true. And they know the, no difference. The only difference between a one-year, uh, I mean a one-year-old and a baby that has just been conceived, the only difference is time and food, nourishment. So we're doing that as a nation, and I guess that's a right to do and, and so forth. So anyway, that's... So it's the dispensation of human government. By the way, some of these dispensations uh, have not ended. There's no indication they end. Dispensation number two, human conscience has not ended. That will last until the new heavens and new earth. That people, pagans, unbelievers in this world have a moral conscience. Also, human government will not end until the, until the new heavens and new earth to control sinners, to punish evildoers, reward good behavior. You know, as Paul says, we're to submit ourselves to the governing authorities because they bear the sword. God has given that. Okay, we come now to the next one. So two of those three we've already covered continue on to this day, human government and the way God manages the world and conscience, the law of God being written on people's minds and hearts. All right, dispensation number four begins when God called Abraham, the Abrahamic promises. Okay, that's the next one, Dispen the Abrahamic promises. You can write that in. Or, the, or promise, the dispensation of promise. Okay, that's, this is the next point at which God gave new revelation about how he's going to govern, and that's in Genesis chapter 12. And remember what the Lord said? You might want to open, let's open our Bibles there to Genesis 12. We need to understand this one as well because there's no indication that this has ended either, the way God is managing the world and will not in the future either. But it says here in Genesis chapter 12, Look at verse 12, verse 1. Chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's household. Go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. That is an unconditional promise. It's repeated to Isaac. It's repeated to Jacob. It's repeated in one way or another about 20 times throughout the book of Genesis where God adds little things here and, and so forth. Um, so uh, that's the Abrahamic covenant. Now, the Abrahamic covenant, there are, you know, we could go into a lot of things. There's a lot of detail to the Abrahamic covenant, but I'm just going to boil it down to two huge promises as part of the Abrahamic covenant. Here's, here's what basically it is. Um, the first one is this. Abraham, God says, you Abraham and your descendants, and later on in the book he says it's going to be through your descendant Isaac, and later, even later he says, and it's going to be through Jacob. Not just descendants of Abraham, because he had a lot of descendants. He had Ishmael, he had Keturah as a wife, 
He had sons and daughters through Keturah, but that they were not children of the promise. It was only Abraham through Isaac, through Sarah, right? And then through Rebekah, Isaac and Rebekah, through would be not Esau, but Jacob. And then Jacob's 12 sons. So very specific, Abraham and his descendants would have a special status before God in the world. That's the Abraham. That's what God is saying here to Abraham. He called him, you're going to have a special status in this world before the Lord. That's what he says. I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to curse those who curse you, and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So that's one aspect of the Abrahamic covenant, and that is that Abraham and his descendants would have a special status before God and in this world. The second part of this administration, this dispensation, is, has to do with the rest of humanity, the Gentiles. Everyone else that's not part Abraham through Isaac through Jacob. Everyone else is Gentiles. And the second part of the covenant has to do with everyone else and how they relate to God's chosen people, God's special people. And he says this, God promised that he would deal with the other families of the earth based on how they dealt with Abraham and his family. I want you to notice the, the differences in these words. You can't notice it in English, but I'm going to share something with you. It's more vivid. He says this, I'm going to bless those who bless you. Now, that's the Hebrew word arar, and both of those, I'm going to bless those arar that bless you, arar. Okay? So there's nothing... Nothing unique about that. God will bless those who bless you. However, when he says, whoever curses you, I will curse. The second use of the word curse, I will curse, God says, is the standard normal word for curse. But the, but the first one, whoever curses you, is a different word. And it has the idea of to be slight or trifling. Huh? Yeah, to be slight or trifling. That's right. In other words, um, God promised to Abraham was that Abraham's family would be so special to God that anyone who was even condescending toward them would bring God's curse upon themselves. The New, Eng the New English translation translates it this way. Those who treat... The one who treats you lightly, I must curse. Condescendingly, lightly, mockingly. You are the apple of my eye, God says in Jeremiah. You're the apple of my eye. And whoever, how you, do you like anyone poking around your eye? <laughs> no? No. Well, no one does. <laughs> You're going to get a knuckle sandwich, you start poking around my, except if you're an optometrist. <laughs> you can do that. But the point is, um, you don't poke around God's eye. So, so basically, God, rule, ruled this dispens God chose to rule this dispensation of promise um, based on two things. Ethnicity and human interaction. Ethnicity, I have chosen you, Abraham, and through you, all peoples of the earth are going to be blessed. And then everyone else in the world, in how they relate to you and how they treat you. So that's... That's the Abrahamic covenant in a, uh, by, by the way, many passages reveal this promise to bless and curse remains in force until now. It hasn't changed. For example, at the end of, at the, end of the millennium, when, when Jesus has brought, when the Davidic king, the son of David in Jerusalem 
on his throne and all the Gentiles and how they relate to him. At the end of the millennial kingdom, when God has brought all enemies under the footstool of his feet, even Satan himself will be cast into the lake of fire, right? And death and Hades will be cast there too. So the final enemy to be destroyed is what? Death. But at the beginning of the millennium, which the Bible says is a thousand years, at the beginning of it, there's going to be a transition between the time of the Great Tribulation, the Lord coming. In fact, Daniel tells us it's going to be 75 days. It's going to take 75 days. You know what's going to happen during that time? God is going to judge who? The nations. And if you want to see what that judgment's going to be like, it has to do with who blesses you and who curses you. Go to Matthew 25. You know what, please, Matthew 24 and 25 is the Olivet Discourse, and it has nothing to do with social justice and doing good works and making sure you give a cup of water to somebody that is poor. It has nothing to do with it. It has to do with the final judgment. Matthew 25, verse 31, the sheep and the goat nations. When the Son of Man comes in his glory. Okay? So there we have when this is going to occur. When the Lord returns. Okay? Not from the rapture. Remember, the church is not in the Gospels. Except promise, I'm going to build my church. The church begins in Acts chapter 2. 50 days after Pentecost. So, the, so this is not the rapture, okay? You don't find the rapture in Matthew 24 and 25 because it's not there. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he's going to sit on his throne in heavenly glory. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to be in heaven, but he's going to sit on his throne when he comes on earth in heavenly glory. Okay. And all the nations, all the nations, remember Genesis 12, 2 and 3, are going to be gathered before him and he's going to separate the people that are left, that survive it, one from the another, as a shepherd, separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Well, who are the sheep and the goats? Well, then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison. You came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, remember these are the nations. These are Gentile nations. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you stranger, invite you in, needing clothing and clothe you? When did, you, when did we see you sick in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you, I will curse. Same thing with the goats, those on the left. Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, you gave me nothing. Thirsty, you gave me nothing. I was a stranger, you didn't invite me in. You didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't, didn't look after me. And they'll say, Lord, when did we see you this and that? And so he'll, he will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So this is that dispensation of the Abrahamic covenant. Okay, let's move on. I want to finish these. The next one is this, the dispensation of the Mosaic law. The next revelation that's given after the time of the patriarchs is the raising up of Moses, you know, bring him out and bring him to Mount Sinai. And that's the Mosaic law or the law, the dispensation of the Mosaic law or the dispensation of the law. The scripture is Exodus 20. And 21, 22, 23, you know. The dispensation of the law can be distinguished 
from those that came before it in one key way. It applies, look, this revelation that God gave, this dispensation, I mean this revelation that created this administration is only applies to whom? Israel, the Jewish people. The law that God gave is not to the church. It's not to the Gentiles. It doesn't apply to them. It applies only to Abraham's descendants through Isaac and Jacob. There at Mount Sinai. That's who it applies to. God laid out a specific set of laws that were to govern Israel. Exodus 22 says, states that only Israel was under this law because God described them as those whom he brought out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And their unique role under this law is repeatedly emphasized, noting that the law was to separate them from other nations. In other words, the purpose for giving of the law with all the, the priesthood, the dietary regulations, the regulations about a woman's uh, uh, period, you know, and cleanness and uncleanness, all those things, all the, uh, all the details that you read about clean and unclean, all that, the one reason was, I want you to be a people that are unique. Not like the peoples of, this, of the earth. Not like anyone else. You are my people. And I want you to stand out and be unique. That was the purpose of it. To separate them from other nations. Now, concerning the Mosaic Law, as far as its end, let me see here. I started out there, the, Mos the Mosaic Law, distinguished from those, yeah, in that way, no overlap with those that f follow. But, yeah, there's no overlap. The law had a clear beginning and it had a clear end. And it governed only the ethnic group or people of Israel. It began on Sinai. It ended at the cross. Jesus abolished the law. The, the veil of the tent was rent in two. Um, because the law could not save, the law could not perfect, the law could not do anything, okay, because we're sinners. So the veil was rent. And um, Paul said, Paul wrote that he, Christ was, is the end of the law. In Colossians 2.14, he says the law with all its decrees was nailed to the cross. Matthew 5.20, he came to fulfill or to bring it to completion, and he did. So the, so the dispensation of the law is ended. Now, here's another one. We come now to the sixth dispensation. It's up there, and that is the dispensation of the church or the dispensation of grace, however, you know, you want to put that. Um, and that is, the that is Acts chapter 2. The church began 50 days following Jesus' death and resurrection. Church is not in the Old Testament. Church truth is not in the Old Testament. It's not in the Gospels. The Olivet Discourse is not about the church. The rapture. Nothing like that. So the church began 50 days following Jesus' death and resurrection on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And more than anything else, the distinguishing characteristic of the church is the baptism of the Holy Spirit into one body. See, God has created now one new body, right? One new body. He says that. Jesus revealed to Paul that the church is one new man, one body, Ephesians 2, which was not foreseen by the Old Testament prophets. They had no idea about this. Ephesians chapter 3. This new body is comprised of all who believe, no matter their ethnic background, their social status, slave or free, or their gender, male or female. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, um, uh, which one did I leave out? Male, what? I said you are Gentile, okay. Or male or female. But when we get saved, we are placed by the, 
into the body of Christ. We're connected, identified with Christ in his body. And although the church itself will never cease to exist, you understand what I'm saying now? The church, what's the church? I'm not talking about the institution that we have on the earth, but, the, but the, those that are in the body of Christ, though the church will never cease to exist, because we see them in Revelation uh, chapter 22, that they're, they're part of the foundation stones. The 12 apostles, along with the 12 tribes of Israel too, by the way. They have a place there. But the point is this, although the church itself will never cease to exist, the way God is currently governing allowing all people the freedom to hear the gospel and believe will come to an end. Both Paul and Jesus prophesied that at an unknown date in the future, Jesus will return to receive the church to himself. And the first time he promised that was John 14. Don't let your hearts be troubled to the disciples in the upper room. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. I go to prepare, and if I go, I will come and I'll receive you to myself. Jesus is not coming back to earth then, but we will, the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will rise. We will, those of us who are alive and remain at that time, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So, and by the way, when that occurs, and it could be really soon, this will be the first meeting of the entire church ever. And it's going to take place in the clouds, not on the ground. It will include the resurrection of all church age believers, not Old Testament believers, church age believers. That comes, they're going to be resurrected. That's at a different time. Now, after the church, after the church, um, there, is a, uh, there are three more dispensations. Of course, you know, while all dispensationalists agree that there will be a future tribulation period and an eternal state, not everyone agrees as to whether or not these should be considered their own unique dispensation. This is where we have the, you know, back of our, that doesn't mean if, that doesn't mean those that think there's only the kingdom and then, and then my position of the other two that, they're not dispensationalists. I am. Yeah, that's not what that, that that's not what that's about. It's just a, a different way of um, uh, dealing with the material and trying to understand it. So I'm presenting this case. Three dispensations. Dispensations afterward. Notice what they are. First of all, the tribulation. The tribulation. The dispensation that immediately follows the church is called the tribulation or Daniel's 70th week, okay? The 69th week, week ended with the cutting off of Messiah. Okay, like the dispensation of free will and the Mosaic law and the church dispensation, the tribulation is going to have a fixed beginning and an ending point. It won't overlap and extend into other dispensations. The tribulation will only last for seven years, shorter than all the others except maybe, which one? The innocence, yeah, that, that most likely, it does, the impression is that that was very short. And what is the primary purpose of the great tribulation? Let's see if I have a picture there. Oh yeah, by the way, that's how the Abrahamic covenant will be unfolded. It unfolded more. Part of the Abrahamic covenant was a promise of land as an eternal inheritance to Abraham's descendants, um, seed, and blessing. And these are all expanded in the Israel land covenant or the Palestinian covenant, Deuteronomy 30, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. And by the way, we... we, we when we get saved, we, we participate in the blessings of the new covenant, don't we? Jesus established the new covenant in his blood. And um, so anyway, so the tribulation, what are the purposes of the tribulation? I wanted to get to this. 
There it is right there, immediately following the church. Um, we have the tribulation. Well, there, it's for two reasons. It's for God to execute judgment upon Israel for their unbelief and rebellion throughout the previous dispensations from the time he called them to be a unique, distinct people. When they, when they made a covenant with God, a conditional covenant, the Mosaic covenant was conditional. There were things God promised to do and there were things they promised to do and they both had to keep their side of the covenant. Well, they didn't. And you know what happened? The times of the judges and the times of the kings, the divided kingdom, the ending of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians and the ending of the southern kingdom, book of Daniel, um, at that time. And now we're in that great image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, the times of the Gentiles where Jerusalem will be trodden underfoot until the times of the Gentiles is complete. And, and this is the completion. When Jesus comes, all, all Israel will be converted. Now look upon whom, him whom they pierced. Now mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. And God will pour out upon them the spirit of grace and supplication. And the blessings of the new covenant will be applied to them with, for whom and to whom it was made. Not, to, not with us. We're just, we're just enjoying. Remember, through you all peoples of the earth will be blessed. Okay, but to, to, to judge and, and upon Israel for their unbelief and rebellion in previous generations, bringing them fully back to himself, Jeremiah the prophet spoke of this time, the great tribulation, when he said this, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Write in a book all the words I have spoken to you, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will bring my people Israel and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave to their forefathers to possess. These are the words the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. This is what the Lord says. Cries of fear are heard. Terror, not peace. Ask and see, can a man bear children? Why then do I see every strong man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor, every face turned deathly pale? How awful that day will be. None will be like it. It will be the time of trouble for Jacob. He will be, but he will be saved out of it. The time of Jacob's trouble. This is the time of Jacob's trouble. So it's going to be a time of cleansing and judgment it's going to be used to finally bring the Lord after tremendous tribulation and Antichrist will be part of the reason for that just like God used the Babylonians he's going to use the empire of the Antichrist too so so pour out but here's another reason to pour his wrath out on unbelieving nations especially those who abused Israel. And at the end of the tribulation, when the Lord comes for the survivors on the earth, remember he says, unless those days are limited, right? No flesh would survive. With the various uh, seal and trumpet and bold judgments. But when the Lord comes, there's going to be 75-day transition before the establishment and inauguration of his kingdom. And during that 75 days, Daniel tells us that in Daniel chapter 12. Um, but uh, uh, before that begins, there's going to be several judgments that take place. He's going to gather all the remaining nations of the world, the people groups, the ethnic groups, all gather them. And he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. The goats are those that when he was hungry... They fed, they cared for them, they clothed them. And it has to do, as much as you did it from the least of these, my brothers, my people, you did it for me. And then he's going to say to the goats, when I was hungry, you didn't help me. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. <clears throat> 
go away into eternal punishment. And so only believers are going to enter the millennial kingdom. Initially, at the outset. All right, so that is the purpose of this. Um, by the way, during this time, God will allow Satan great freedom to rule this world to, to almost the full extent of his power. Read Revelation 12 and 13. The unholy trinity, trinity Satan, the, the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, the unholy trinity, almost to his full power. However, even though Satan will be in power, he will rule only as an agent within God's administration. He will rule only within God's administration. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Satan is not a sovereign that can do, that has almighty power. No, no. He is under the direct administration of God and what God allows. And even though he will, he will allow Satan to inflict punishment on his people... I mean, it's going to be a time of terrible time for them. Um, he will not allow them to, him to annihilate them. There will always, God always has a remnant, especially of, of his people. Even Paul says in Romans 11, you know, has God cast off his people whom he foreknew? No. He says, I, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. God always has a remnant. That he preserves. Okay, that's the dispensation of the tribulation. By the way, the tribulation will culminate when Satan and the Antichrist bring their worldwide army to the gates of Jerusalem to permanently demolish, annihilate, and destroy it. Once and for all. And at that time, by the way, Satan tried to do that through Herod at his first coming, right? At his second coming, it's going to be even more massive. Because this is near his end. Okay, at that time, Jesus was going to return to Basra, to the Valley of Megiddo, to the Mount of Olives in a series of battles to free his people, ending in the complete overthrow of the Antichrist and his rule. Revelation 19. Okay, the next dispensation is the dispensation, the, the millennial kingdom. And by the way, you get, and by, oh, the dispensation of the tribulation. Where do we find information out about this? The most information in the Bible about the great tribulation is found primarily in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, chapter 11, chapter 8, the book of Daniel, and Revelation 6 through 19. Now, as far as the millennium is concerned, it's the next distinct period of God's governing over this world. This kingdom dispensation will begin 75 days following the second coming of Jesus. It also has a specific length of time. Revelation 20 says 1,000 years. says it seven times, just so that we don't, we get it. There's no secret meaning of that. There's no meaning behind the words. At which point, it's going to end. And God's going to give up the, after all enemies are brought under his footstool. And Satan is cast into the lake of fire. Death itself and Hades gives up the dead in them, the great white throne judgment. And death and Hades and the whole is cast into the lake of fire. Then the end will come. And there'll be a new heaven and new earth, uh, new heavens and a new earth, and, and the new Jerusalem the heavenly seed of God will come out and dwell upon the new earth. And that's going to be, a, that's, the, that's called the dispensation of the fullness of time. When all things are completed and brought in under Christ. 
Okay, so let's look at the dispensation, dispensation of the millennium, and that is this, the place where you find out most about the millennial kingdom, the most information is not the New Testament, it's where? The Old Testament, the prophets. Because this has to do with David. This has to do with the Davidic king, the one who's going to sit upon the throne of David and the, to whom all the Gentiles will come. Isaiah the prophet says that. He says... Yeah, he has these, these various... We find most about the kingdom in the prophets. And it's detailed, a lot of information. It's conditions, what it's going to be like. Um, but I do believe that as we come to the end of the millennium, which is right here, Come to end of the, I know that this is seven years and this is a thousand. The perspective isn't, isn't right, obviously. But as you come to the end of this time here, this dispensation, this way of administering the world is going to end. There's going to be a beginning. There's going to end. And we're going to go finally into the last dispensation, which is um, the end, the, the fullness of the times. The fullness of the times. Listen, the Apostle Paul referred to this one right here in Ephesians chapter 1. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. Let me... Let me go to something else, see if I have... There was another one I went... No, that's that one. Oh, no, not that one. No. Oh, rats. I guess I didn't put it on there. Oh, well. Anyway, it's the dispensation or the administration of the fullness of the times. Now, um, how do we know there's going to be a, dis uh, a division there between the millennium? Well, first of all, it's going to be a thousand years. And then we come to Revelation 20. It says, and I saw a new heaven, a new earth. What's going to happen to the first one? It's good. Read Peter, 2 Peter. It's going to be destroyed by fire. The elements are going to melt in, the, in fervent heat. And everything will be burned up. And God will create a new earth, just like Genesis chapter 1, and a new heavens. And the thing about this earth, there's going to be righteousness, okay, like it was intended to be. And the, the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, is going to come down out of heaven on, and God and man will dwell together as it was always intended to be. And there'll be no more, you know, There'll be no more death and there'll be no more crying and mourning and pain and all these things because those things, those former things will be passed away. It, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 if you want to see the apostle, what the Apostle Paul says about this and then we'll wrap and then we'll be done. I think the eternal state is a separate dispensation and it's eternal. And it's a new way that God is going to manage the earth because it's going to be a new earth. And um, you want to read, find out about how it's going to be what the new Jerusalem itself, the city is going to look like that comes down. Revelation 21 and 22 talks mo doesn't talk about the new earth and its conditions except it says there's no more sea, right? No more sea. By the way, where all the oceans and seas come from? The ones we see today all around us, what are they reminis reminiscent of? The flood. Where did all that water go if it covered the earth? Well, it's still here. It's just in the ocean basins. So it's still here. So the rem the, that's, there will be no more ocean, no more sea. But in, in, rather than describing all the conditions of the earth that we all want to fi find out about, what is described in Revelation 21, 22 is what? The heavenly city, the new Jerusalem that comes down out of God and dwells with men. You want to find out what that place is going to be like? It's going to be huge. But 
that's going to be our eternal home, and we're going to be able to come and go freely. Read Revelation 20 and 22 and the description of it. The church is there, the 12 apostles. Israel's there, the 12 tribes, right? Um, so let's read this. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ was first, right? Then when he comes, those who belong to him. Okay? Then notice this. Then the end will come. Now watch this now. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after... After he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he, Jesus, must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So after he has destroyed all dominion and authority and power, and he reigns for that thousand years, the last enemy that's going to be destroyed is death. And that's true. Go to Revelation chapter 20. At the end of the millennium, uh, Satan is released from the bottomless pit. He goes out to deceive the nations once more. They're crushed, and their rebellion is overthrown. Satan is taken, and he's cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet already are. For a thousand years they've been there, and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever, and then death and Hades will give up the dead they're in, all the damned and lost, Will be, will be brought up before the great white throne and death and Hades and the whole ball, ball of wax and everyone associated with it, and that's lost people, will be cast into the lake of fire with Satan. And by the way, the lake of fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. But those that join him will be there too. And then there'll be the, then the next... The next way God is administering is to destroy this present heavens and earth and create a new earth and a new heavens and to have the new Jerusalem, the holy city, dwell with men. And I just can't tell you how excited I am that by the grace of God and the mercy of God, I'm the richest person in the world because I'm saved. And I'm not, I'm not saved because I'm boasting, but I am and I'm so thankful. And I'm, I trust every person that's here today knows that you've been, you've been saved. You've, you, you know your names in the book of life. Not because you're better, you're not. You've been saved by grace, right? Jesus saved you. And you now belong to him, and this is your future. It's, best, it's better than anything you've ever had so far, I'm telling you. It's coming, and we need to keep our mind and eyes on that. Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to see how you are managing, administrating you, this world, using various groups and people groups, and how throughout, over a course of time, you've revealed new, new ways of your, the way you're managing things in this world. But it's all for your honor and your glory. And, and it's still yet to come different ways that you will do that, and it ends up back where we began at the beginning as uh, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we're thankful that we will dwell with you physically in, in glorified bodies once again. So help us as we honor you this week. May you be at the forefront of our thinking and thoughts. Help us in our relationships with people that we will be kind and we will be forgiving, and we will be Christ-like. In Jesus' name I pray.